Hi, I'm Henry Farrell, and Abraham Newman and I are happy to be able to talk to you about weaponized interdependence today. Abe is a professor at Georgetown University, I'm a professor at George Washington University, and we have been working on the questions around weaponized interdependence for a number of years. What we want to talk to you about today is how it is that weaponized interdependence is changing the world. Because we live in a world which has been fundamentally and profoundly transformed by globalization. 30 or 40 years ago, the nation states of the world were not nearly as deeply interconnected with each other in terms of trade, in terms of information, in terms of finance, as they are today. And when this began to change, when we began to see the world coming closer and closer t together, being bound together by a web of networks, people had all sorts of theories about the consequences that this was going to have. By and large, they saw this as being a good thing. They not only thought that this would result in greater economic efficiency as uh, world markets replaced national markets, but they also thought that this would mean the increase of the power of consumers and the power of business and the decrease of the power of the state. And in particular, they thought that the kinds of geopolitics that we had seen during the Cold War, when states maneuvered against each other for strategic advantage, they thought that these days were gone forever. Now, we are discovering that they were very badly wrong. We live in a world which is deeply interconnected, but this is not a world that is uh, completely devoid of geostrategic politics. To the contrary, we have seen how various global networks are increasingly being weaponized by states that are pursuing geostrategic advantage over each other and also using these networks in order to bring businesses, individuals, other actors whom they uh, want to bring to heel. They're using them to effectively coerce and subordinate these actors. This is a very unexpected outcome in world politics, and it is one that we are only beginning to truly understand. So in this lecture, you're going to get a sense of what is happening. We're going to begin by explaining to you what weaponized interdependence is, what the fundamental concepts are behind it. Then we will talk about the consequences of weaponized interdependence, how it results in these two effects that we call the panopticon effect and the choke point effect. After describing what this means, we will talk about what it looks like in practice, giving you a detailed understanding of one particular aspect of how the panopticon and the choke point have been deployed by the United States of America. Then we will look at how different states are looking to respond to this new set of challenges that is posed to them as networks are being weaponized against them. And finally, we will examine a set of new questions that this le uh, leads to. We will begin to examine the new agenda that we need to pursue if we are to understand how the world is changing around us. So the idea of weaponized interdependence, as we have developed it, was first clearly laid out in an article that both of us uh, wrote, which was published in the journal International Security and appeared in the second half of last year. What we wanted to get at with this article was a number of important changes which we felt were really reshaping the ways in which states engaged in coercion within the world. Because obviously states have engaged in a variety of forms of coercion for a long period of time. They have engaged uh, in uh, various forms of military coercion where they make military threats. They have also engaged in various forms of nation state level economic coercion when, for example, one state uses sanctions which are based on denying access to other states or to other financial entities or other firms, denying these states or firms access to its own domestic market. But what we figured was that there was something else and that was important and that was different that was beginning to happen, in which states were not just using military coercion or military force, not just using the power of their domestic markets, but instead were turning to global economic and informational networks as a way of coercing other states. Uh, some states were more uh, better p positioned than others to do this, and of all of those states, the state that was best positioned was the United States of America. So we really wanted to understand what was happening and how the US was able to engage in these forms of global coercion, which would have appeared to have been impossible 15 or 20 years ago. The fundamental insight behind this is that globalization, the globalized world that we live in, relies on a set of world-spanning networks. 
If you want to understand globalization, you want to think about its effects probably in terms of the vast increases of flows in trade, of flows in information, of flows in capital, and to a lesser extent in flows of people that we have seen over the last 30 or 40 years. It is very, very hard to understand how fundamentally transformed the world has been by these flows. We now live in a world in which nation states still continue to play a very, very important role, but in which they find themselves embedded in these networks. They find that these networks cross their borders and these networks have consequences for the kinds of things that they are or are not able to do. If you want to be able to participate in the world financial system, you need access to the world's financial networks. If you want to participate in the world, uh, world information system, you probably want to have some degree of access to the internet and so on. So these networks have become fundamental and crucial to the basis of our economies, the basis of our societies, the basis of our politics. They have transformed domestic spaces and made them into nodes in this global network and withdrawal from these uh, various networks can have potentially devastating consequences for the economy economy, for politics, and for society. Of course, we were not the first people to identify the crucial role of global networks to the world. But if you look back at the way in which most people have thought about global networks, they have adhered to a standard story, which is perhaps best set out by Thomas Friedman in a 1999 article that he wrote in the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. So what Friedman wanted to capture in this article was the way in which the world had changed over the previous 10 years. And so what he suggested was that there had been a world which had been divided by a wall, divided by the Berlin Wall, which had divided the countries of uh, communist Central and Eastern Europe from the countries of the West. This was a wall which had military implications. There was the Warsaw Pact on the one side and NATO on the other. There were also economic implications. There were the uh, Comic-Con uh, countries. Uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union satellite states, engaged in, a various, in various forms of complex economic coordination and exchange. Uh, but on the other side, of course, were the countries of the uh, free industrialized world who had their own very different sets of institutions. So you saw, in effect, these two different world systems which were divided by a wall. And Friedman suggests that this wall had been toppled. And instead of this wall, we had a web. And here he used the analogy of the World Wide Web and suggested that this gave us a broader sense of the networks that were connecting the world together. These were, rather than a wall that was dividing, they were a web, a dense, int intricate web that was tying us all together, that was binding us together in these mutually agreeable relationships of exchange, of uh, commercial benefit to everybody, and that this was effectively a world which was wonderfully and marvelously different than the world that Friedman had grown up in. That we now had moved from a world of political divisions, a world of geostrategic maneuvering, in which the Soviet Union and the United States had maneuvered against each other using uh, military and using uh, economic force and power, we had now moved from that world into a world of peaceful mutual exchange based upon the kinds of web that was provided by the internet, provided by commercial exchange, provided by trade, provided by the free and easy movement of capital, and all of these other good and wonderful things. So that was back in 1999. If we get into a time machine and go forward to 2019 and 2020, we see that the world has been transformed, but not in the way that Friedman and other people like Friedman expected. For sure, there is a web, and there are many webs, many different networks that pull the different states of the world together into a common system. But this is not by any stretch of the imagination looking like the kinds of peaceful system that Friedman imagined that it would be, in which everybody engaged together in mutual beneficial commerce and exchange. Instead, we are seeing how these networks are being turned into tools of state coercion. We see this with the way that Donald Trump has weaponized the US dollar. He has used the US dollar as a means to project power against other states. 
We see this in the kinds of systems that are being used to deprive Iran of any access to the global financial system, uh, that these networks have effectively been weaponized against countries such as Iran. We see how it is that countries such as Japan have used their control of certain key nodes in the production of certain very, very uh, difficult to manufacture chemicals. They have used this as a tool of coercion against South Korea. And finally, we see how it is that the technology industry, uh, the uh, manufacture of semiconductors and all of these other very, very complex, very specific technological products, how this is rife with all of these bottlenecks, all of these choke points in the system, and how it is that states are using these choke points in order to try and coerce other states. So, Indeed, we are in a world which is being pulled together by a web, but this is not the kind of gossamer thin web of a beautiful mutual exchange that people like uh, Friedman imagined. Instead, this is more like the web that you can imagine Shelob having woven in The Lord of the Rings, in which uh, we are all unfortunate hobbits, trapped and entangled as we see the spider coming towards us preparing to drain off our vital juices. So it is not the peaceful, happy world that we thought that we were going to be in. How do we understand this? Well, this is the purpose of our work on weaponized interdependence. And our argument is pretty straightforward. If you want to understand how these webs, these networks have become tools of state coercion, you need to understand that they don't work in the ways that people thought that they worked, that instead of being these decentralized networks, which would be very, very difficult to control, they instead are centralized. They tend, by and large, to be centralized so that exchange tends to go through certain kinds of key hubs. And if you are a state which has potential control over one of these key hubs, if you are what we call a privileged state, then you are in a space that allows you to exercise coercion against other states by using your control of the hub to exercise broader control of the network as a whole. And this is something that the United States in particular has been able to take advantage of in some quite extraordinary ways. But we also see how it is that the United States efforts to weaponize these networks against other states are resulting in some degree of pushback as other states are trying to find ways to defend themselves, other states are trying to push back, and over the next number of years we are likely to see some important new politics developing as states try to figure out ways that they can cut themselves out of these entangling webs that they have found themselves being trapped in. This suggests then that in order to understand this new world, we need to abandon a certain number of liberal illusions that we have had in the past. And we've already mentioned Thomas Friedman's work. Thomas Friedman, not only the 1999 article, but also his extraordinarily influential book, The World is Flat, are arguments that we live in a fundamentally decentralized world, a world of webs, of networks which pull us all together, but in which it doesn't make any sense for any state to try to use uh, coercive tools, to try and use the uh, network against other states. Instead, these networks, what they do is they reduce the ability of, of states to engage in traditional kinds of coercive geopolitics. So Thomas Friedman and a variety of other people writing back in the uh, 1990s and the 2000s, uh, Kenichi Omai is one example, uh, Francis Fukuyama has a uh, somewhat more sophisticated take but still is in the same genre. All of these people foresaw a world in which the old struggles of geopolitics were going to be replaced by com a peaceful commercial exchange across networks. So that is one set of ideas that is turning out to be incorrect. We also see in the work of Anne-Marie Slaughter, who is a uh, very, very uh, well-known uh, liberal uh, scholar and theorist. She has suggested that we live in a world in which we are moving away from the chessboard of standard geopolitics into a web of relationships. And again, here the fundamental notion is that this is a decentralized network. 
And what this means, for example, is that if the United States or other states want to uh, project their uh, influence in this world, they need to do this by cooperating peacefully with other actors, forming network relations, and in general, not behaving according to the old strictures of power politics. Now, what these people plausibly didn't get about the way in which the world was changing is that the networks of the globe are not these decentralized networks, but instead they are centralized networks. So if you look at the picture in the middle, this is a picture of a standard grid of street maps. And if you think about uh, a standard, uh, a standard uh, grid, then you can imagine that if you're trying to get from point A to point B, and if, for example, one of the intersections in this uh, grid is blocked, then it's going to be slightly inconvenient, but nonetheless probably pretty straightforward for you to find an alternate route. You can just route around the intersection that is blocked, you can find a different path, and there are going to be many, many different possible paths between any two locations in this grid. If you want to get from one address to another address, there are going to be multiple different ways that you can get there. And if one of these ways is blocked, there are going to be other ways that you can find pretty straightforwardly. So this is the kind of underlying assumption which really shaped the thinking of an entire generation of liberal thinkers about how a network world was going to work. It turns out, however, that the world looks much more like a different kind of network, which is a hub and spoke network. So this is a network that some of you may be familiar with. This is a map of the Delta Airlines routing network, so how you get from point A to point B. And what you will see here is that this is not a network in which all nodes are equal. This is instead a network in which some nodes play an incredibly important central role. So that, for example, if you want to get from Acapulco to uh, Caracas, then you need probably to tra travel through Atlanta Airport. And Delta has organized this in, a, uh, in this way, it has organized its network in this way, because it is much more cheap and much more efficient for it to organize it in this way than, for example, to have a whole lot of uh, of uh, straight, uh, straight uh, journeys between cities like Acapulco and Caracas, uh, Delta is able to economize extraordinarily if it relies on everybody to go through this central point, which is Atlanta. So this is a hub and spoke network in which there is a small number of central hubs. Obviously, Atlanta is by far the most important, but you will also see that uh, New York, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, these are also significant nodes in the network which play a secondary role. But what this means then is that this network then becomes much more vulnerable to potential forms of breakdown. So that imagine if, for example, for some reason, Atlanta airport is shut down, there is a, a storm of some variety which uh, shuts down Atlanta for two or three days, then suddenly the entire network is likely thrown into chaos. That is not to say that the network will be completely disabled, there will still be some routes which work, but nonetheless, a Delta as a whole is going to find it extremely difficult to maintain. And if you are a traveler trying to get from Acapulco to uh, Caracas, or any one of a variety of other routes, you are going to find it extremely difficult to use uh, to do using Delta's airlines. So what this tells you is that uh, if you have a network which is centralized, then the central hubs play a crucial role in allowing the network to function. And if those central hubs are taken out of action for some reason, then we will see that it becomes far, far more difficult to use the network as a whole. And also you can imagine that there might be other ways in which this centralization might have consequences. Imagine, for example, that you are trying to uh, track how it is that people uh, use Delta Airlines, or you're looking for, for a specific individual who you know is going to be traveling on Delta from one point to another uh, on a particular day, then you don't have to control the entire network in order to be able to see a significant majority of networks uh, of the network's uh, flights. All you have to do is to uh, position somebody in Atlanta who is uh, going to monitor the people going back and forth, and pretty likely you will be able to see who it is that is the individual that is trying to get from point A to point B. So 
The fundamental lesson here is that networks very often are not decentralized. Instead, they very often turn out to be heavy, heavily centralized, and this has consequences for how they work. Why is it that networks are likely to evolve in this way? Well, there are a number of possible reasons, and I will briefly go through three of them. One of them is the reason that we likely see with Delta. That is that centralized networks may turn out to be much more efficient, a much better use of resources if you're trying to minimize costs for various forms of travel or transport or getting things or getting information from point A to point B. It is much more efficient to do this with some degree of centralization than it is to have a completely decentralized network. There may, however, be other reasons. It may be, for example, that you want to maintain a certain degree of power. So if, for example, you are a business who wants to uh, maintain some degree of monopoly position, uh, you plausibly are going to want to structure networks so that you are capable of monitoring and doing whatever you need from a centralized point, because this then allows you to exert control over what the various uh, users of your service are doing. It may also be that if you are, uh, for example, you are a business, you want to try and establish a monopoly in a given uh, sector, uh, that one way in which you can do this is again by making yourself into a central intermediary. So that, for example, if you are Google, you are trying to use your uh, network centrality, the uh, power of your brand, you are trying to use this in order to uh, make yourself an essential central actor in other networks uh, by, for example, uh, using Google Pay. If you're Facebook, you're trying to make yourself the central experience that everybody uses to keep track of the uh, web in general, and so on. So that commercial actors, uh, as well as you can imagine political actors uh, for other reasons, commercial actors have an incentive to try and create these uh, centralized points of control for themselves. And finally, it may not need any direct volition or design on the part of actors to result in a network that is centralized in these kinds of ways, because if, if you have what is called preferential attachment, so that, say for example, you have a network that is growing, nodes are being added to this network, and each node, when it is added to the network, it wants to connect to other nodes. And if you assume that nodes that are added to the network are slightly more likely to connect to other popular nodes, uh, uh, to prove the existing popular nodes, that is nodes that have plenty of other attachments, than they are to unpopular nodes, then you will find yourself in a system in which the popular nodes, those that are heavily connected to, get more and more connections over time so that their advantage becomes self-reinforcing in a way which again results in a relatively high degree of centralization within the network. Now, this then, it turns out, has political consequences. You can see the political consequences in this map. This is a map which used to be highly classified. Uh, you see at the bottom all of, these, uh, all of these denotations which say that it's top secret, which say that it is compartmentalized intelligence, which say that it cannot be shared with foreign individuals. All of this tells you that this is something which is politically, plausibly, a pretty important map. And why this map is important is because it reveals the way in which the centralization of networks has provided the United States with a crucial advantage. So this map was prepared by the National Security Agency, the NSA, as part of a classified briefing on how it is that the NSA is able to tap into global communications. And the reason why it is able to tap into global communications is because the internet is much more centralized than people realize that it is. Uh, much of the internet's traffic travels across what is called the internet's backbone. That is a, a set of cable stations, of fiber optic cables uh, between these stations, uh, which, which carry huge amounts of data very, very quickly and in high volume, but which also are very, very heavily centralized and are centralized in ways which provide the United States with access. 
So you'll see that the map describes these seven access sites, these so-called international choke points, which allow the United States to uh, dip in at these seven different places, all of which are located within the United States borders. Uh, the United States can then di dip in and see what it is that people uh, in Africa, for example, are saying to people in Europe or South America, because all of this information travels through these uh, centralized nodes in the network, and these centralized nodes in the network can be tapped into by the United States. So that is effectively a pretty important a pretty important consequence of how it is that networks can be centralized. So we describe two ways in which this has consequences for global politics. One of these we call the panopticon effect. And here we are building upon a notion developed by Jeremy Bentham, the uh, famous uh, philosopher, which was then described at greater length by Michel Foucault, which is this notion of this idealized prison called the Panopticon, where it will be possible to look at every individual prisoner to see what every individual prisoner was doing from a centralized location. So here you see what the design looks like. There is a central tower and the observers in this tower are able to look into these open cells and able to see at any moment what a, a prisoner is doing. So here we see how it is that if you have a network which has a central point, it is possible to use that central point in order to see what it is that other people are doing, what it is that other people are saying to each other, uh, to be able to tap into their communications, and by so doing, to get an extraordinary strategic advantage by really understanding what it is that all of these other people may be saying to each other. Perhaps they think that they're doing so in secret, but instead they are doing so in ways that you can observe and providing you with the information that you might need to uh, have in order to plan your own possible responses to their uh, planned actions. So this is what we call the panopticon effect, when a network is centralized, uh, if an actor, if a state can seize control of the central point, it can then use it in order to tap into other people's communications and see what they are saying to each other so that effectively it becomes a means of turning the network into a distributed system of surveillance. That, however, is not the only way in which you can imagine this kind of network being used. You don't simply have to limit yourself to spying. You can use your central control of the network as a tool of active coercion. Because uh, if a network is centralized in this way, if it has a hub, then so much of the communications goes through that hub that you are then able to effectively say to a adversary of some sort, whether that is another state, another business, an individual, you are able to say to that adversary that you are denying them access to the network as a whole. By controlling the hub, you may be able to exercise a much broader control over the network as a whole. And this is what we call the choke point effect. So that you use your control of the centralized hub and you are effectively able to deny other actors access to a global network. And as you remember, some of these global networks have become crucially intertwined with our domestic economies, with our ways of doing business, so that if a state suddenly finds itself denied access to uh, one of these global networks, uh, the financial network or whatever, it may find that many of its ordinary ways of doing uh, business within its own borders, let alone what happens outside of its own borders, uh, that its ordinary ways of doing business are fundamentally undermined and made impossible. And you can exercise some quite extraordinary consequences if you have control of a choke point for one of the globally important networks. You may be able to use this for some very, very extensive forms of coercion of a kind that might not have been imaginable a decade or 20 or 25 years ago. This is, in a sense, the dark side of globalization. All of these networks that we thought would be used to make trade, to make exchange much more regular, much more routinized, much more something which was outside of the ability of states to stop, 
Instead, we find that some states, so states that have control of these centralized points, are able to use them not only for surveillance, but also to choke off access to businesses or individuals or even entire countries. So once you understand weaponized interdependence and these two different effects, the panopticon effect and the choke point effect, you begin to get a much better grasp on what lies behind some of the key controversies in the world today. Take, for example, the controversy over Huawei. Huawei is a major Chinese telecommunications manufacturer, and it wants to build out the infrastructure for the world's transition to 5G. 5G is a new standard for wireless communication that would not only underpin uh, the ways in which smartphones talk to each other, but also the way in which a whole plethora of other devices connect and communicate with each other. Uh, these are the devices that would allow you to build smart homes, smart cities, smart countries, and perhaps create a whole lot of new and unexpected uses. Huawei wants, in effect, to be the company that builds out the backbone for these uh, different systems to allow uh, different telecommunications companies in different countries to uh, then uh, link together these devices using 5G. That sounds like a laudable aim, and furthermore, Huawei should be pretty well positioned to do this. Huawei has very, very good technology and is typically prepared to supply that technology more cheaply than its major competitors. Nonetheless, Huawei has encountered extraordinary opposition from the United States and from a few key US allies. The United States has sought to extradite Huawei's chief financial officer and heir apparent, the daughter of the company's founder. It has also sought to do everything it can to prevent its allies, to dissuade its allies from uh, buying Huawei technology for their uh, 5G systems. And finally, it has sought to threaten Huawei by potentially withholding key US technologies, by potentially telling US firms that provide semiconductors, that provide operating systems that Huawei has, by telling them that uh, they uh, deal with Huawei at their own legal peril. That is something that seems perhaps strange unless you understand the hidden struggle that is happening beneath it. Because as we've discussed, the United States has been very effective in turning the world into a kind of a global surveillance system through penetrating other forms of technology that are used uh, for telecommunications, including the centrality to the uh, global internet backbone that we discussed earlier. This is a pretty good position for the United States from which it has gotten substantial strategic advantage. China, in contrast, has been cut out of this and from many other global networks because at the point when these uh, networks were first being created, China was still struggling to catch up economically with the Western advanced industrialized countries. And so what the United States fears is that, the, uh, is that it may now find that China leapfrogs it uh, by using Huawei as a proxy for Chinese geopolitical interests. The United States looks at Huawei and does not see a company that is looking to uh, try and build out for its own profit. It sees a cat's paw for the Chinese state, and it worries that if Huawei built out this 5G technology, it would be able to do to the world what the United States has done to the world in the past, and perhaps do it better and more comprehensively. Because not only might Huawei allow China to use the panopticon effect by perhaps providing the Chinese state with access to this telecommunications infrastructure by informing the United States about vulnerabilities, flaws, and backdoors that might be uh, potent potentially weaponized, but it might be that in a situation of confrontation between China and other countries, that Huawei's uh, grasp on the technology could then allow China to perhaps employ uh, choke point effects as well by uh, critically damaging the technologies that these countries need in order to operate their uh, communication systems and hence knocking them off the global grid. This is something that the United States fears, uh, whether correctly or incorrectly, and that the United States is prepared to do more or less anything that it can do in order to prevent from happening. And one of the ways in which, of course, the United States is trying to do this, as I mentioned, is through its control of global supply chains. Because there are key U.S. technology companies that produce uh, semiconductors, uh, i.e. Qualcomm, 
Also, because there are key U.S. companies that produce operating systems such as Google's Android, uh, the United States can try to use its uh, influence over these companies in order to try to uh, control Huawei and in order to effectively threaten Huawei with uh, the withdrawal of access to technologies that it needs for its products to operate. And this, of course, is creating a new set of challenges, a new form of global confrontation and global struggle, which you cannot really understand unless you pay attention to the politics of networks that is happening beneath this apparent. And this also ties into the kinds of uh, kinds of platform economies that we have built across different sectors. Because if you think, for example, about Facebook, you can plausibly see that Facebook is what might be described as a digital panopticon. Uh, it is possible for Facebook to see what all of its consumers are doing, what all of its users are doing. It is uh, This is the basis of Facebook's business model, is its ability to uh, rent the attention of its users to advertisers. And in order to be able to do this effectively, Facebook has built this vast distributed system which is aimed to gather as much information as possible on its users so that they can be served up in uh, neatly labeled tranches to uh, other businesses who want, for example, to be able to uh, sell things to middle-aged uh, Caucasian people living in Philadelphia who have an interest in skiing. Uh, Facebook has to be able to gather all of this information in order to be uh, able to market this. But you can also imagine how this presents important and valuable opportunities for states then to use uh, Facebook's uh, access to this fire hose of uh, carefully labeled information as a means of achieving their own objective uh, objectives and priorities, uh, some of which may not be a commercial in nature at all. Finally, we see how it is that the physical infrastructure, and this goes back to the uh, point that you saw in the NSA graph, we see how it is that the physical infrastructure of the internet has been designed in ways which again make it possible for uh, countries, including the United States in particular, to really get access to people's information and understand what they are doing. So this is a picture of a server farm. If you want to see how the internet actually works, people think about the internet as being this thing which exists out there in some kind of a ethereal alternative reality. But in fact, the internet uh, consists uh, of fiber optic cables and also of these server farms where uh, row after row after row of blade servers is uh, connected into the internet, providing services such as Amazon Web Services, which allow for businesses or for individuals if they want to host their activities on these centralized systems which are far cheaper to run than a more distributed and disaggregated internet used to be so the more that it uh, that these uh, the uh, that these uh, these activities become centralized the more tempting it is for states to use the businesses which have control over these centralized hubs of information as a proxy so that they can achieve their own strategic priorities and objectives. This then provides us with the basic information that we need in order to make sense of the Snowden revelations and their political consequences. What the Snowden revelations showed us was how much the NSA, the National Security Agency, and various counterparts in other allied countries were engaged in distributed surveillance. So that the internet appeared to its users as this vast anarchistic utopia, this libertarian playland in which they could talk to each other, argue with each other, do more or less whatever the hell they wanted with a high degree of anonymity and privacy. But while people thought that this was what the internet was, in fact, the internet had been turned into this vast machinery of surveillance. It had been turned into something very like Bentham's Panopticon, in which it was possible from these central points to look at what people were doing, to take in huge, huge, huge volumes of data, 
and then, vi then winnow this data down for the precious nuggets of information which were strategically valuable to the United States and its allies. So this was a fundamental transformation which happened within the shadows of globalization which we were not really capable of understanding until the Snowden revelations. And even then, in order to really understand how this was possible, you need to have this basic grasp of the ways in which this apparently decentralized network of the internet instead turned out to have these central choke points which allowed for the NSA and other actors to uh, gather information to themselves. Of course, it wasn't just the NSA and uh, Western intelligence agencies. We also know that other intelligence agencies, including China, including Russia, including Israel, including North Korea, were gathering up as much information as they could too, but we don't have nearly as much data because we don't have the appropriate leaks that would help us to, uh, to really understand what they were doing. But we can imagine that it was probably not dissimilar in scale purpose and intent, and perhaps uh, even more wide-ranging in some ways than the forms of data collecting activity that the United States and its allies have been engaged in. So digital communication uh, is not what we thought that it was. The internet, this vast global playground of freedom, instead turns out to be a kind of distributed panopticon. However, it's not just the internet that we need to pay attention to. There are many, many other networks that help globalization to work, some of which are nearly as important as the internet, but far more obscure and far less well known among the general public. Perhaps the most important of these is the so-called SWIFT network. So SWIFT is a obscure seeming technical organization which allows for a system of financial messaging between banks and other financial institutions, whether these be corporations, whether these be stock exchanges, whether these be insurance companies, all of these different entities rely in one sense or another upon SWIFT. So every time that somebody wants to make a financial transfer from one, one institution to another, they almost certainly are going to do this through the SWIFT uh, messaging system. Effectively, what SWIFT does is it provides a secure and a reliable means of uh, saying to one financial institution that uh, this transfer has been made and then allowing the transfer in an important sense to be consummated. So there are many other aspects to the global financial system which uh, you need to uh, look at too in order to get a full understanding, including uh, the uh, dollar clearing system. But SWIFT plays this essential role which is very, very poorly understood except by financial specialists. But again, because SWIFT plays this role, it is central to the global financial system. It is uh, very, very difficult to make global transfers of uh, money without having some exposure to SWIFT. And hence, it became very, very quickly an important target of interest for the United States when it started to begin to think about how it was that it wanted to uh, be able to uh, weaponize interdependence. The first important consequence of SWIFT was that it provided the United States with what amounted to a global panopticon. And this was especially important in the wake of September 11, 2001. In the lead up to the uh, September 11 uh, plot, the hijackers had used the global financial system to make a series of money transfers which had financed their activities. Nobody had paid any attention to these financial transfers at the time, and the United States uh, didn't realize uh, their existence until after it was too late. Obviously, the United States wanted, in a hurry, after September 11th, to make sure that it would have the capabilities to detect such plots and such activities in future. So it began thinking uh, rapidly about what kinds of data sources there might be out there. And it very, very soon realized that SWIFT provided it potentially with an unparalleledly rich treasure trove of information on who was transferring money to who within the global financial system. Now, SWIFT was a Belgian entity incorporated under Belgian law, but nonetheless, SWIFT had located within the US borders, it had a uh, data, it had a, a data repository, 
And this then allowed the United States to start to subpoena SWIFT in the weeks after September 11th to subpoena SWIFT for access to uh, vast amounts of information. This was very uncomfortable for SWIFT, which realized that it was, it was effectively breaking Belgian privacy law by providing the United States with this information, but nonetheless, uh, given the uh, legal penalties, given the sensitivity of the questions involved, SWIFT felt that it had to go ahead. And this proceeded uh, without very much in the way of public debate until the New York Times in 2006 revealed what SWIFT had been doing in a front page story, giving rise to international furore and a series of complicated negotiations between the United States and the European Union over the circumstances under which SWIFT might be or might not be allowed to provide uh, access to this data to US authorities. Nonetheless, this data turned out to be extraordinarily valuable to the United States in providing it with a secret backdoor to the global financial system, which it could then use to keep track of uh, entities uh, which were of suspicion to see who was transferring money to these entities, who these entities were transferring money uh, to in their turn, and hence to get a detailed understanding of various actors and their financial relationships to each other, which provided it, according to various reports, with the ability to uh, foresee in advance various plots and to thwart them before they were able to come to fruition. SWIFT was also, of course, useful against other uh, various uh, forms of activity that the United States was worried about, such as, for example, nuclear proliferation and North Korea. So, SWIFT then provided the United States with an unparalleled ability to create this system that allowed the uh, United States to turn the global financial system into a kind of panopticon of financial information where it had a central point from which it could observe uh, who was talking to who and dip into data on their specific transfers in order to build up a very detailed and particular understanding of relationships that were of concern to it. However, United States relationship with SWIFT was certainly not limited to the panopticon effect. In addition, the United States, together with its European allies, deployed SWIFT with a variety of other measures aimed at uh, weaponizing the global financial system. Uh, they deployed them to force Iran to abandon its nuclear program. This was one of the major strategic uh, concerns during the Obama administration was the fact that Iran appeared to be on the verge of building uh, nuclear weapons, which could have had very, very problematic geopolitical consequences within a, a very, very unstable region of the world. So the United States uh, managed to persuade its European allies over a period that it was appropriate to mount a general set of measures which were intended to isolate Iran so that it no longer had effective access to the global financial system. Some of these measures included secondary sanctions, which relied upon the United States' control of another aspect of the global financial system, the so-called dollar clearing system, but SWIFT and access to SWIFT also played a central role in the United States deliberations and in the United States and Europe's efforts to uh, use coercion against Iran. Because together with the secondary sanctions, uh, the uh, United States and Europe agreed that SWIFT would withdraw access uh, to SWIFT's messaging system from as many as 30 of Iran's major banks. And this then had some very, very important consequences. Because without access to SWIFT, it became far, far more difficult for Iranian businesses to get paid for uh, their transactions. It became very difficult in particular for the Iranian oil sector to arrange for payment for oil that was exported, which of course was one of the crucial backbones of the Iranian economy. Uh, without SWIFT messaging, it was impossible for banks in Iran to really have any relationship with banks in the other parts of the world. And together with the system of secondary sanctions, which relied upon the dollar clearing system, Iran found itself swiftly being transformed into a pariah in the global financial system, which meant in turn that its economy was very, very, very severely hampered indeed.
This, according to all accounts, is what led Iran to the negotiation table, led Iran effectively to abandon a program that appeared to be a key, key priority of the Iranian regime in exchange for being readmitted to SWIFT and in exchange for relief from these secondary sanctions. So here, effectively, the United States, together with Europe, worked in order to exploit this choke point, exploit this choke point in the global financial system, and then use this choke point to coerce Iran into doing something that it would have been very, very difficult uh, to imagine Iran doing other, other circumstances, uh, forcing Iran to abandon its nuclear program, and achieving what was an extraordinary diplomatic success in getting Iran to agree to a set of conditions under which it would no longer entertain its nuclear ambitions. So this then demonstrates how powerful these coercive tools can be. What this all suggests is that weaponized interdependence is important in world politics and is arguably becoming more important still. We are seeing, of course, uh, during the coronavirus, how it is that states are, are beginning to weaponize not just the kinds of networks that we talked about in the article for international security, but also are weaponizing global supply chains against each other, leading to new forms of geostrategic contention. So in order to understand how this is likely to change world politics, we need uh, collectively to start thinking about different questions than the questions that we have thought about in the past, because the kinds of consequences that globalization is having are not the consequences that the standard liberal story suggested that they would have. So what do we do in order to understand this new world that is emerging? First thing that we need to do is to start to actively map the global networks that we are talking about. This is something that we have only the barest grasp of at the moment. Uh, in particular, if we are looking at networks such as supply chains, uh, this data is proprietary. It is not the kinds of information that governments have been gathering. But now that we know that these kinds of uh, networks, whether they be supply chains, whether they be financial networks, whether they be information networks, now we know that they pose critical strategic vulnerabilities to states. We really need to understand how these networks work better in order to uh, get a better sense of how it is that these geostrategic politics are likely to work uh, going forward. And we not only need to map these networks individually, we also need to understand how these different networks intersect with each other, because it could be, for example, that uh, when you take actions against a business uh, using financial uh, measures of one sort or another, such as sanctions, it could be that this business has uh, a role in supply chains, which could cause major disruptions, which might be good news or bad news, depending upon the kinds of effects that you wanted to achieve. So we need to understand better how these networks work, we need to map them more clearly, and we need to map the points at which different kinds of networks, such as financial networks and production networks, intersect with each other in order to get a better understanding of how world politics is likely to change. We also need to have a better understanding of how it is that states can or cannot exercise this kind of control over these central points in the network, can exercise control over hubs. And we have some speculations, we have some basic intuitions, but we need to build out from these intuitions. We need to understand, for example, we need to understand the kinds of institutions that allow states to use market power, for example, to get a hub actor, whether this be an actor such as Swift, or whether this be an actor such as Facebook, to obey uh, their demands. We need to understand how informal norms play a role. One of the interesting puzzles is why it is that the United States has not used its central role in uh, the global telecommunications networks and in the internet as a tool of coercion. Uh, and one of the reasons we suspect why this is true is because of norms that suggest that the United States ought to be interested in free and open communication across the world, uh, which has restrained the United States from using its control over these uh, platforms, using its control over the global telecommunications infrastructure in order to achieve certain kinds of effects that it might otherwise be tempted to to achieve. Finally, we need to have a much better understanding of the circumstances under which private actors are or are not going to be prepared to comply with what states want them to do. Most of the key networks have some 
important degree of private sector involvement if they are not controlled by private sector actors altogether. So we need a much, much more sophisticated understanding of how it is that private actors and states uh, are going to intersect with each other and under what circumstances private actors are going to adhere to a state's, uh, state's demands, under what circumstances they're going to push back, and also perhaps under what circumstances private actors may be capable of influencing states' understandings of the strategic options that they have. We also need to understand how it is that some states are pushing back. Because very clearly, if you are a victim of weaponized interdependence, you do not want to remain a victim forever, and you are going to turn to various means in order to try and uh, prevent other states from pushing you about in future. It could be that you try to uh, isolate yourself from the networks that you fear are going to be used against you. It could be that you uh, try to create alternative networks that try, to, uh, that try to replace the networks. It could be that you try to uh, figure out other means of coercion. All of these are crucial questions that we simply don't understand nearly as well as we want to understand. The broader agenda then is to develop a dynamic model of how it is that the networks on which weaponized interdependence relies are likely to change over time. Because as some states uh, seek to use these as forms of coercion, as other states seek to resist this coercion, we may expect the networks to change in some important ways. And we need to understand better what are the alternatives that target states have. As uh, I've just mentioned, you can imagine that they want to retaliate, that they uh, want to uh, figure out ways that they can push back against states that are weaponizing networks against them. They may want to insulate themselves from these networks by withdrawing from them or by uh, limiting their vulnerabilities in some other ways. Or as we said, they may want to uh, create some counter networks. And again, we want to pay attention not just to state strategy, but to private actor strategy as well, to understand the kinds of alternatives that businesses might have to a world of weaponized interdependence as well. There are various efforts by businesses to create what they call digital Switzerlands, for example, uh, areas where they uh, would feel themselves to be, to some extent, uh, perhaps uh, less vulnerable to state pressure, but we need uh, to do a lot more research to understand whether this is possible, whether this is not possible, and under what conditions might firms be able to exercise some degree of independence in this new world of weaponized interest. We also want to be careful to acknowledge that states don't just need to respond to weaponized interdependence, through other forms of networked activities. It could be that, for example, they might want to respond to various forms of uh, networked coercion through physical retaliation. And we've seen some of this happening in the way that Iran has reacted to the re-imposition of uh, measures by the Trump administration, including uh, some degree of isolation from SWIFT and including uh, secondary sanctions. The uh, Trump administration pulled out of the deal that the Obama administration had made on Iran's nuclear program, and Iran has not taken this lying down. Uh, there is uh, some evidence to suggest that uh, Iran has engaged in a variety of plausible attacks against uh, various tankers which are uh, moving through the Straits of Hormuz, which is an area that is exceptionally vulnerable to Iran. And one plausible interpretation of this is that Iran is effectively saying to the United States and to US allies, if you continue to uh, squeeze us in these kinds of ways, we have options that are open to you, which you are not going to particularly like. And one of these options might include holding the uh, world's uh, energy system hostage through a means of physical coercion. So this is something that is important and is another important area of complexity, is how it is that weaponized interdependence may intersect with more traditional forms of coercion. Finally, we want to think about how it is that weaponized interdependence may be reshaping the way in which the United States uh, intersects and interacts with its allies. So if we return to the question of Huawei, which we have mentioned already, one of the key problems that the United States confronts is that uh, it's, it, it does not want uh, its allies to uh, use Huawei products because it fears that this will then uh, expose them to uh, surveillance by China. 
and uh, that could have uh, uh, secondary vulnerabilities for the United States, but it is finding that its ability to persuade its allies not to use Huawei equipment is much more limited than it might have hoped. And the reason is uh, straightforward. Uh, first of all, Huawei uh, provide goods which are pretty uh, cheap and pretty uh, efficient compared to their competitors. And secondly, many of these allies are pretty used to being spied upon by the United States. And so their attitude very often is, well, we're going to be spied upon by all of you people anyway, so why, not, why don't we just accept that and get the cheapest and the best telecommunications uh, equipment possible? And so now we are seeing the United States beginning to, uh, beginning to try to uh, exert various forms of uh, coercion against allies to try to persuade them not to use Huawei. We're seeing a resistance from some of these allies, albeit not all of these allies, and we're seeing how this is going to have potential consequences for the relationship between the United States and its allies. What kind of a world is this going to result in? It's still early days, but we're beginning to see some patterns emerging. It's clear that we are going to see some degree of withdrawal from uh, some of the global networks that have uh, enabled the globalized economy to work. But it's equally clear that it will be extraordinarily difficult, extraordinarily costly for states to withdraw from these en masse. So the kinds of talk that we see about a move to a decoupled world, uh, this is going to happen to some limited degree, but perhaps to a far more limited degree than people understand or anticipate, because all of our economies are deeply interpenetrated by these networks. They rely upon these networks, upon these financial networks, upon these production networks, these supply chains, these trade networks. They rely upon them for their basic operation. So we are in a world that Abe and I have described in an article for Foreign Affairs of chained globalization, where we are all chained together, where those chains are becoming increasingly constricting, where we can possibly cut some of the links in those chains, but where effectively we are going to find that whether we like it or whether we don't, we are going to have intertwined fates in a world in which it will be impossible completely to turn back the clock of globalization. So we are now going to find ourselves in a world where, uh, where policymakers are going to be thinking not just about economic efficiency when they think about globalization, but they're going to be thinking about security interests as well. And so this is going to result in the remaking of various economic relations. We're going to see how it is that uh, departments of trade and departments of commerce are sometimes going to have to take the back seat as uh, the more security focused agencies begin to reshape the globalized world and the globalized relations that we live in. But we're also going to see some continued degree of reliance upon these global interdependent networks and chains simply because it is almost impossible to remake the world uh, back to something like what it was back in the 1970s. So we have argued uh, that this is a that this has a variety of consequences. First of all, that we need to all recognize how it is that these global networks are by their very, na very nature going to generate geopolitics. They are going to create these possibilities for states to control networks by taking control of centralized nodes. And it is extremely difficult to stop these networks from becoming increasingly centralized over time. So we're now going to see how it is that we try to rebalance security against efficiency in this world. We're going to have to think about a much more sophisticated set of concepts that will allow policymakers to try to take as much advantage as they can of the benefits of globalization while minimizing the risks. And again, in our article on uh, change globalization for foreign affairs, we lay out some specific recommendations as to how this might work. And we also recommend that policymakers need to really understand that this stuff is not going to go away. They cannot fully withdraw from interdependence. They cannot fully protect themselves from the weaponization of interdependence. So they need, in a sense, to recognize that we are in a moment which in some ways is like the moment that the world was in after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where policymakers realized that there was a set of gaping vulnerabilities that they needed to understand if they were to continue forward without exposing their citizens to vast risks. 
Obviously, the risks of weaponized interdependence are in some ways, uh, they are much less egregious than the risks of uh, global nuclear warfare. Uh, it is unlikely that weaponized interdependence is going to result in the world being transformed into a charred radioactive wasteland. But on the other hand, uh, all of this stuff is much, much more complicated than was the world of nuclear strategy, because there is a much wider variety of actors who are involved, not just uh, politicians and generals and nuclear scientists, but also in this new world of weaponized interdependence, we have businesses, we have uh, activists, we have uh, all of these complicated relationships, which we have barely even begun to map, let alone properly to understand. So this is an important set of new questions, a uh, huge new agenda for research that we need to start thinking about in a much, much more systematic way. So thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in the uh, topics that we have discussed, go to uh, www.weaponizedinterdependence.com, which is a website where we try to keep track of this. Follow us on Twitter at World Weaponized, and uh, there are a variety of other resources. Uh, there are podcasts, there are articles. All of these are available from the uh, weaponizedinterdependence.com website. And if you have any comments or arguments or disagreements, we would love to hear them from you. Thank you again, and goodbye.